suburban bowling club in Western Sydney might seem like an unlikely venue for a discussion of international war and politics. But for Maha Habib, the US government's declared war on terror is very close to home. Her husband, Mamdou, was arrested in the early days of the war. He's been detained by America in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, for over two years. Extraordinary world events have thrust her into a very public spotlight. Thank you very much for everybody being here. Um, to be honest, I came to a stage where I thought I was fighting a lonely campaign, but looks like having everybody here, I'm not by myself. I really thank you all for being here. Maha and Mamdu Habib's lawyer is Stephen Hopper. In another sign of the unusual nature of this war, he's never been allowed to meet or speak with his detained client. The information blackout means that mystery surrounds many aspects of Mamdu Habib's detention, but new information is emerging. A week or so ago, Maha and I travelled to London and then to Manchester to speak to two people who had actually been in Guantanamo Bay and who were then released. The two men had seen Mamdu Habib in Guantanamo Bay and provided the first eyewitness account of his physical and mental state. Now, Mamdu couldn't walk properly and he couldn't walk with his eyes open. Uh, when he came back, Charik asked him about that and he said, why can't you open your eyes? What's wrong? Why are you so unsteady? He said, well, when I was in Egypt, I was blindfolded for the entire time. Um, I was electrocuted by them. I was beaten regularly and tortured. The two British men were released from Guantanamo Bay without any charge. They're not facing any charges at home either. Despite this, Tarek Dergul wanted his identity disguised for this interview because he's scared of being vilified in the street. To me, he was a nice guy. Spoke good words. You know, we could relate to him. You know, spoke, spoke about his family constantly. Tarek claims that in Guantanamo Bay, he saw Mamdu Habib being dragged around in chains and bashed. He also says American interrogators told Mamdu his family is dead and that Mamdu firmly believes this. Alhamdulillah. Darling, take care of yourself and children. Say hello to everyone. For Maha, this explains why Mamdu has not written to her since March last year. And I said, it's just not him. You know, there must be something wrong. I've mentioned that and I've said that so many times. But when we went to London after speaking to the um, to Tariq and Jamal, it made sense to me as, as to why he hasn't been writing because they said he believes that his family's been blown up and they don't exist. Perhaps the most disturbing allegation, though, concerns what happened to Mamdu in Egypt, where he was detained for around six months before Guantanamo Bay. Tarek met Mamdu in the hospital shortly after he'd come from Egypt. Very confused, dizzy, I mean, dazed, I mean, weak, so he spoke very slow. Uh, spoken riddles. I couldn't really make out. Well, you, I mean, you're telling me like some stuff about Egypt and being taken to Egypt and blah blah blah. Mumdu explained he'd been no, brutally been, tortured. Uh, been, been, he told me that he's been electrocuted. You know, put in water. You know, electrocuted. Um, uh, been stripped, been punched, kicked and punched. He uses a punching bag. Um, so I make about a dog being put on him as he was naked. Uh, cigars put out in his, his body. Mm, blindfolded. Allah is with you. 
God is with you, that means he means. Some hint of what he'd experienced had already been received in his letters home. I've been blindfolded for eight months. I never see the sun, but I see you and the kids every minute. I never forget you or forget my children. They took me to Egypt and they say they want to bring you in Egypt and the kids. And I was suffering to not let these people bring you in Egypt. And I hope you are still in Australia. Were being treated with respect in this it was only after the British men's allegations were made public that the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs revealed Mumdu had in fact made similar allegations to them two years ago. To give you a complete picture, I think it's important to say um, that uh, on the first Australian visit to Mr Habib in, in Guantanamo Bay, which was only 10 days after his transfer there from Egypt, Mr uh, Habib made some serious complaints about maltreatment during his time in Egypt. To find further evidence about the authenticity of these claims, Dateline travelled to the Gulf state of Qatar. I'm here to see a man who says he has inside knowledge of Mamdou Habib's time in Egypt. Four, five, four, five, zero, three. Four, five, zero, three. One, one, zero. One, one, zero. Dr. Najib Al-Nalmi is a lawyer and the former Minister for Justice in the government of Qatar. He has impeccable contacts in the Arab world. Dr. Najib says that towards the end of Mamdu Habib's time in Egypt, he received information about the Australian. They said he will die. Tell me more specifically what you were told from your sources about what happened to Mamdou Habib in Egypt. Well, he was in fact tortured. He was interrogated in a way which a human cannot stand up. And, and you, you know this He's, absolutely? Yes. We were told that he they, they, ring, they, they rang the bell that he will die if somebody have to help him. And again, did your sources tell you what kind of things he was saying in Egypt to his torturers, to his interrogators? My sources did not say exactly what dialogue, but they said that he accepted to sign anything. So he was talking lots? Yes. <laughs> Whatever you want, I will sign. I'm not involved. I'm not Egyptian. I'm, so, I'm Egyptian by uh, background, but I'm Salian. And, uh, but he was really beaten and he was really tortured. Do you think it's, it they tried to use different ways of, of treating him in the beginning, but in the end of that, they thought he was lying. And that's why they were very tough. There seems little doubt now that Mamdu Habib was tortured in Egypt. But why was he ever sent there? He was arrested in Pakistan. And despite being born in Egypt, Mamdu Habib has been an Australian citizen for two decades. He travelled on an Australian passport, even getting tourist visas when he went to visit his parents in Egypt in the past. What we believe happened is that he was handed over to the US authorities by the Pakistan government at the request of the US authorities, and the US authorities took him to Egypt. And they took him to Egypt because, firstly, it was convenient because they could have a cover story because he was born in Egypt, so they could just try and, you know, s smooth over why he was there. The second reason why they took him to Egypt is because they knew he'd be tortured there and they wanted to get whatever information Mumdu might know that would be useful to them out of him. I want to know under whose authority um, he was transferred to Egypt. To answer this, we need to go to Pakistan, to the beginning of Mamdu Habib's journey. According to his wife, Mamdu Habib came to Pakistan in July 2001, looking for a sea change for the entire family. The Habib's life in Sydney had turned sour. They'd been traumatised by the murder of one of their son's young friends. A business deal had gone wrong 
and Mumdu was facing animosity from some members of the Muslim community in Sydney who accused him of being a CIA spy. So was, was he feeling a bit disenchanted with life in Australia? Yes, um, what really also encouraged, encouraged us, you know, we sat down and talked and we thought if we go out of Australia, maybe a couple of years or something, um, away from all the headache that we had, um, maybe we applied for different countries to, to go. We haven't heard any from anybody, but uh, one of those countries was Pakistan and we, we got the visa, but um, we thought it would be more wiser if he goes himself and check, because it's, it was going to cost us a lot of money. According to Maha, he was here on a three-month visa, checking out potential business opportunities and looking for a school where his children could get an Islamic education. Mamdu was also suffering from depression. And he was on medication, he was seen, um, you know, treated for that. And when he left, he was still on medication. When he left for Pakistan? Yes. Were you worried about him? Of course I was worried about him, yeah. Mm. He's my life. Him and my kids, are, they're, they're my life, you know. Halfway through his journey, the attacks of September the 11th occurred in America. Almost overnight, the situation on the ground in Pakistan profoundly changed. The Pakistani president, General Musharraf, threw his support behind America and a period of unprecedented American and Pakistani cooperation began. Dr Najib al Naomi was one of the first lawyers to represent people arrested in what he says were joint Pakistani and FBI operations. They will start arresting people where they are known as, you know, students coming to Pakistan or religious schools where they are teaching learning as well, or charity workers. This group start picking up on these people. So how big was the FBI involvement in this? They were totally involved in all the arrests. All the arrests, they were aware of it, they were making database, they were collecting all information. Much of this activity centred on the province of Baluchistan, closest to Afghanistan. In early October, Mamdu Habib was in the capital, Quetta. It was from here he called his wife. Then he, fa he made another phone call and saying that he's, um, he's on his way back home. He left it on the answer machine. And we never heard from him since. On the 4th of October 2001, Mamdu Habib came here to Quetta bus station. He was on his way home. It was here he met two German nationals, Ibrahim Diem and Beckham Adimi. Dateline has seen copies of the interviews these two men gave German police when they returned home. They said they met Mamdu here and upon discovering they were all trying to get to the city of Karachi to fly out, agreed to travel together. He talked to us because we were Europeans. We found out we had the same way as far as Dubai. We bought a ticket to Karachi. The Australian lent us the money. The two German men were fleeing from Afghanistan. While in their police interviews, they both gave frank admissions about their time spent in al-Qaeda training camps, neither of them said they saw Mamdu Habib in Afghanistan. Under intensive questioning, they did not incriminate him in any terrorist-related activity. What could you tell us about the Australian? First, I know he's called Habib. Later, I know Mamdu. He comes from Sydney and has four kids. He said he had great problems in Australia and he wanted to immigrate to Pakistan. The trip was about seeing whether it was suitable for the family to come. He said he liked Pakistan. <laughs> 600 kilometres into the journey, the bus was stopped at the town of Kuzda. Pakistani police arrested all three men. Dateline asked the Pakistani interior minister why Mamdu Habib was arrested. Was he arrested because he was under surveillance or was he merely caught by chance? 
we, we've uh, gone through a long uh, process of uh, investigation as far as these forums were concerned. Mm -hmm. and, and, and without any doubt, uh, let me uh, uh, confess and let me share, share with you that there is certainly a very strong linkage of uh, this gentleman and uh, as I already mentioned to you, some other people also who were also actively involved with this gentleman in assisting uh, the uh, extremist elements, the terrorist elements, at that point in time. But despite the assertion of terrorist links, later in the interview, the minister suggests that Habib was arrested merely for being in the restricted province of Baluchistan without the correct visa documents. If you are not allowed to go to Balochistan, if you haven't applied to go for a visa for Balochistan and you are found to be in Balochistan, obviously you become a suspect. There is uh, no denying that fact. So people in, foreigners in Balochistan in 2001 were automatically considered oh, suspects? Yes, yes, certainly, yes. Mm. Could it be possible that someone was there who wasn't involved in Al-Qaeda or terrorism? If. Uh, if a person is not involved in any of these activities, why should he or she be in such a sensitive area, in such a sensitive place? There has to be a strong suspicion regarding uh, anyone's uh, involvement in that respective region. I, I, suspicion, but, but not necessarily evidence. It, it always starts with suspicion. Suspicion eventually leads you to a certain amount of evidence, and we have evidence to that effect. However, there are some who cast doubt on the veracity of Pakistani intelligence. Yasser al-Siri is an Egyptian Islamist wanted by the Egyptian government. He's exiled in London, where he heads the Islamic Observation Centre. He says that Pakistan often exaggerates the importance of people they arrest in order to win favour with America. He's investigated the case of Mamdu Habib and believes this is what's happened to him. In Qatar, Dr. Najib al Naomi argues that the sweep that picked up Mamdu Habib was not based on good intelligence. But how could an intelligence service like the Pakistanis and the FBI make such big mistakes? No, they know what their ideas. The ideas are this. Let us pick them all up and find out which one is really belong to Al-Qaeda and which one is actually a supporter or a member or associate. But they ended all of them actually in Guantanamo. After his arrest, Mamdu Habib was taken briefly to a prison in Quetta. Then he was moved here to Islamabad. Pakistani authorities did not tell the Australian High Commission that they detained an Australian citizen. But someone did tell the Australian Federal Police and the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation, ASIO, because they turned up in Islamabad and visited Mamdu Habib in prison three times. Mamdu Habib's lawyer wants to know how Australian intelligence got involved and what they knew about Habib's detention in Islamabad. Now, if they've seen him in the prison in Pakistan, what are they up to? They, they would have heard Mamadou's story and they would have been in contact with other intelligence agencies on the ground there, such as the CIA. And then they would have reported back to their political masters in Canberra. So, there seems to be a chain that leads all the way back to Canberra. And we'd like to know what the Prime Minister knew, what the... Attorney General knew and what the Foreign Minister knew about this. The Australian government has told Dateline that their officials found no evidence that Habib had been mistreated. 
The two German men arrested with Mamdou Habib were released into German custody after several weeks and flown home. Dateline understands they were interrogated by the FBI before they left. Mamdou Habib, however, remained. Well, what the German government did was quite simple. They just put a bit of pressure on the Pakistanis and said, you know, we're not going to tolerate you holding our citizens and we're not going to let the US interfere with our citizens. We want them back. It's as simple as that. Now, the Australian government just didn't try hard enough. Did the Australian government ask to have Mamdou Habib deported to Australia? No, they did not. The High Commissioner in Islamabad, Howard Brown, told Dateline that he vigorously attempted to get consular access to Mamdou Habib, but was denied. He said he wasn't told Habib was being sent to Egypt and only found out after he'd gone. The High Commissioner was told by Australian law enforcement authorities. So who organised and authorised the removal of Mamdou Habib to Egypt? A source who's spoken to Pakistani intelligence told Dateline that after Pakistan finished interrogating Mamdou Habib, he was handed over to the FBI. They interrogated him here at Chakalala Airport in Islamabad. Then the source says the US sent him to Egypt. We pursued this allegation with the Pakistani interior minister. And who sent Mamdou Habib to Egypt? You see now, uh, you are uh, transgressing into some very sensitive areas, you know. <laughs> this is, you know, our, our, uh, unfortunately we cannot simply share the, uh, the outcome of the investigations with, with anyone. Was it a Pakistani decision? It, it's, uh, obviously it's a Pakistan decision initially, because if, if anyone who's caught on Pakistan soil, it's, it's Pakistan's uh, uh, decision, it's Pakistan prerogative, certainly. And it, so just to clarify, it was a Pakistani decision to send him to Egypt? It's not, it's not exactly Pakistan decision. You know, a person who's caught in Pakistan, let me also clarify this. Mm. If he or she is of Pakistan origin, certainly they, they do not uh, go outside Pakistan. If that person is of uh, foreign origin, then if he or she is wanted by a foreign government, any government, uh, they, they put in a request to Pakistan and under certain arrangements which we have, on a reciprocal basis, on a bilateral basis, even with some countries on a multilateral basis, uh, we feel that their request is valid and genuine, then we do accede to that request. Which country are you talking about? I'm talking of all these countries, the US, the European Union, Egypt, you know, all these countries, you know. So are you, are you implying that Egypt requested... No, Egypt, did, no, no, Egypt did not request us. Egypt definitely did no, not request no, Mamdou Habib? No. Mm -hmm. So did the United States request Yes, they did request us, yes. United States requested that he be sent to yes. Egypt? The US, the US wanted, they, they wanted him for their own investigations. Mm -hmm. Now we are not concerned where they take him. You don't see it as Pakistan's issue? No, it's not. As far as we, are, we were concerned, we were satisfied, satisfied with our own investigation at that point in time. Um, once that was uh, over, once we, we were satisfied with our own investigations, Certainly we, uh, we had uh, no problem in handing him over to another ally of ours. The, the Americans? Yes, that's mm -hmm. right. It's clear, therefore, that at the time Mamdou Habib was sent to Egypt, he was in American custody. It's also clear that Egypt did not request his extradition. So why did the Americans send him? Egypt has a long history of um, use of torture on persons uh, in detention and we believe that Mamdou was sent there for the express purpose of interrogating him under torture. Steve Watt is with the Centre for Constitutional Rights in New York. He represents many Guantanamo Bay inmates in America, including Mamdou Habib. What this is, is state-sponsored abduction and that's a violation of international law. This is a serious allegation, but not an isolated one. Although there's been little discussion in the West, the Arab world is on fire with talk of an American policy called rendition, essentially farming out detention and interrogation. 
There are dozens of documented examples of this happening, not just in Egypt. We represent uh, Maher Arar, a Canadian of Syrian descent who was rendered um, by U.S. authorities um, to Syria, a country with it, which he had no connection for 17 years. He's a, he's a dual Canadian-Syrian citizen, but had left there when he was, he was very young with the rest of his family. He was sent back uh, to Syria and he was interrogated under torture. And the ambassador to uh, Washington, the Syrian ambassador to Washington, in an interview said that they took Maher as a favor to the United States government and that they shared all the information uh, they gleaned from Maher, including information under torture, with the United States and that they were communicating with the United States throughout his detention, a detention which lasted uh, one year. Montasser al Zayat is a leading Islamist lawyer here in Egypt, where the practice of rendition was pioneered. While he says he knows of one case in the last few years where Americans were actually present during the interrogation, the normal practice is for the locals to do the job for them. الأجهزة المصرية تتضمن أسماء الشخصيات ونوعية المعلومات المطلوبة عن مثل هذه الشخصيات وبالتالي السلطات المصرية تقوم باستجواب مثل هذه الأسماء أو هذه الشخصيات وتقدم معلومات عنها للأجهزة الأمريكية It's alleged there are also thousands of cases where suspects are picked up and interrogated purely to provide intelligence for the Americans. Syria, Morocco, Egypt, um, Pakistan, uh, Jordan, uh, Saudi Arabia, Emirat, uh, Qatar, uh, Philippines, Thailand, uh, they are detained because they were requested by the American. They are even interrogated on behalf of the Americans, with, with some people sitting on the back side and, and getting the information, the questionnaires, because the Americans have a database from Guantanamo. The policy of rendition started well before September the 11th, but since then it's become much more widespread as America's need for intelligence has increased. بعد أحداث 11 سبتمبر زادت يعني أو أجبرت هذه الأنظمة على التعاون التام فقط ليس تبادل وإنما التعاون التام جبرا وسواء بالرضا أو بالجبر فإنه يتم التعاون والتنسيق ليس قلت مصر المغرب الأردن اليمن الأردن أيضا من الدول التي يعني تتعاون بشدة وهناك قمع في سجونها لصالح الأمريكان أيضا في المغرب سلم حول 23 شخص في ولكن وضعه في معتقل السري تمار السري في المغرب ولا ولا أحد يعلم عنهم شيء وإنما سربت المعلومات عبر معتقلين آخرين كانوا في هذا السجن. Here in Egypt, torture in prisons is endemic, as seen in these pictures painted by torture victims themselves. It's no accident that the countries used for rendition by the US have such a reputation. According to Tarek Dergul, a former inmate of Guantanamo Bay, US interrogators used rendition as a direct threat. Talk to us or be tortured overseas. I was first, first of all in in, in Bagram, I was beat up by an interrogator and told that you know that he would kill me um, and told that I'll be sent either to Morocco or Egypt. That was my first uh, first time I had been threatened being sent to Morocco or Egypt. The next time was in Cuba, and then again, by an interior, threatened to be sent to Morocco or Egypt. 
Dateline approached the CIA, the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, the National Security Council, CENTCOM, the State Department and the Department of Defence to talk about rendition and Mamdu Habib. They all refused to comment. However, in the hearings of the 9-11 Commission a few months ago, a former State Department intelligence official said renditions were a key counter-terrorism strategy. We will first discuss the CIA's support with renditions. In other words, if a terrorist suspect is outside of the United States, the CIA helps to catch and send him to the United States or, or a third country. The CIA itself was active in these... Ex-CIA director George Tenet was even happy to acknowledge that 70 people were rendered prior to September the 11th. At our disposal. There were, you know, I, I've testified there were over 70 renditions. It's a policy. I mean, former director uh, of the CIA, again, George Tennant, testified to that fact. He said it's a policy of the United States. They, they use it and they've used it effectively and they're, they're proud of uh, what it achieves. And while we were collecting... We Proud of the intelligence, but not necessarily the methods used to extract it. The official position of the United States is that it does not condone or use torture. We do not condone torture. I have never ordered torture. I will never order torture. The values of this country are such that torture is not a part of our soul and our being. But in the Arab world and among lawyers representing Guantanamo Bay inmates, this is not accepted. In fact, they regard rendition as the deliberate outsourcing of torture to give the US some deniability. Particularly so when the United States has signed up to the Convention Against Torture and said that it would never do this, uh, this kind of action. Um, also in light of the fact that there is uh, an act of Congress which makes it U United States policy um, that it will not send persons to countries where there's a substantial likelihood that they'll be subjected to torture. So that makes it all the worse that they are actually doing this entirely outside the law and in flagrant violation of their international and domestic obligations. After around six months in Egypt, Mamdu Habib turned up here at Bagram, the US base in Afghanistan. This was the first time that the United States publicly admitted he was in their custody. Bagram Air Force Base is under the complete jurisdiction and control of the United States military. Um, so it's them that uh, would, would have had to authorise the plane that touched down. And uh, from the information that we have, uh, Mamdu was taken to Egypt by the Americans and he was flown out of there by the Americans. By May 2002, he was sent to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. And it seems a safe assumption that any intelligence gathered from his interrogation in Egypt would have come with him. Stephen Hopper says this kind of evidence is massively flawed. It's been proven over hundreds and hundreds of years of the development of the common law and our legal systems. It just cannot be relied on. People will say anything to stop pain or psychological torture. Just because they say it doesn't mean it's true in those circumstances. Three years after he was arrested, Mamdu Habib has still not been charged with anything. Though the American administration has indicated recently he's likely to be listed for a military tribunal soon. The Australian government is convinced that Mamdu Habib, like the other Australian detained at Guantanamo Bay, David Hicks, does have a case to answer. Um, and in fact, we know, um, because we've received advice on these matters from the United States, um, that the charges that will ultimately be brought evolve around their training with Al-Qaeda um, and uh, laxa e toiba and that uh, their involvement with those organisations has been of a very significant order. Well, I would say that's bullshit. Mum do he wasn't training with Lasker El Tiber. And it's, it's, it's very funny that this allegation wasn't raised until Lasker El Tiber was prescribed in uh, November last year. Now, come on, the Australian government's got to put up or they've got to shut up. What is the evidence? What is the evidence that a 47-year-old, overweight man, trained? I don't believe there is any evidence. 
I believe that Mr Habib was picked up in a general sweep of Pakistan in the lead up to the war in Afghanistan. I believe that perhaps his documents weren't in proper order and he was taken in for further questioning. At this stage, either Australian intelligence officials or the CIA got involved and life went downhill dramatically for Mr Habib at that stage. Just how far downhill is probably best judged by his deteriorating mental health. Psychiatrists who deal with torture victims say treatment is essential. According to recent reports to the Australian Parliament, Mumdu Habib is still spending periods in solitary confinement. He's also at times refusing to take his medication for depression. Mr Habib has not been communicative uh, and he only provides feedback on his welfare in response to direct questions. He does not always answer them. Uh, he can be belligerent in, in discussion with, uh, with our Consul General, but uh, for the most part is simply uh, uh, reluctant to communicate. In May this year, US authorities conducted an evaluation of his physical and mental condition and said follow-up care was not needed. However, based on conversations with other recently released inmates, his American lawyer is concerned. Uh, extremely concerned. Um, they were actually housed in cages beside Mamdou Habib for um, a number of months. And just two weeks prior to their departure from uh, Guantanamo in March, uh, they said that Mamdou couldn't even recognise them. They also said that he, um, he, he looked physically unwell. They said he'd fallen down in his, his cage at one point. He'd been mistreated by the guards. And he told a whole litany of horrors that he had been subjected to during interrogation. So he's in a very bad way physically and mentally. Is he willing to listen to three, three and a half year old? Maha Habib is continuing her own campaign to have her husband released. Today she's waiting outside a TV station in Sydney. The Prime Minister is inside and she wants to hand him a letter on the way out. You won't be stopping the car. The car will just keep going past you. Okay. You've got to understand it's the Prime Minister of Australia. He'll travel out of the studio and keep going. Okay. I'll definitely hand him the, 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 the What's letter. What's so letter. special about Prime Minister? Well, I'm here for my husband's right, yeah. for my family. Okay, my I can appreciate that. Okay. This day, Maha Habib is unsuccessful. However, she's vowed to keep trying to bring her husband home. My husband never committed no crime, crime being committed against him and against us, OK? If he has committed any crime, all right, bring him here, let him see justice. But if he hasn't done, just let him go and let him see his family. Almost three years since it, 29th of July, he'll be away from us for three years now.